Welcome back. Today I'd like to talk to you about antiderivatives. And uh, let's start by talking about this definition I have written down. Uh, and that is that a function capital F is called an antiderivative of a given function little f on the interval i if capital F's derivative is little f for all x's in the interval i. So let me give you just a quick example here. Let's say that we had a function little f of x, which was equal to 3x squared. And uh, I wanted to know, well, what is an antiderivative, capital F of x, for that function little f of x? In other words, can you find a function whose derivative is 3x squared? And maybe you say, uh, sure, I could figure out a function whose derivative is 3x squared. How about x cubed? x cubed's derivative is 3x squared, and that's exactly right. So I would say that capital F of x equals 3, I'm sorry, is equal to x cubed, this function right here. That is an antiderivative of the little f function, 3x squared. So in essence, antiderivatives are just inversing the process of taking a derivative. A derivative finds you a derivative. An antiderivative tells you where did that derivative come from, in some sense. Okay, So uh, that's the idea of an antiderivative. It's just what's a function whose derivative is this guy. Now, let's do an example or two just to um, make sure we get it. So let's find an antiderivative of the following functions. Okay, so let's just find an antiderivative. for the following. Let's say that we have f of x is equal to x to the fifth. Then what would be an antiderivative for this function? Uh, in other words, what's somebody whose derivative is x to the fifth? Well, you might have to think about that one just a little bit harder than you did on the last one, uh, but it's still not terrible. Uh, you no, kind of think that, well, it probably is going to have to do with an x to the 6th. But it is an x to the 6th because the derivative of x to the 6th is 6x to the 5th. But if we multiplied this guy by a 1 6th, then everything's fine, right? And we get the correct derivative. In fact, this is true in general when we're trying to take an antiderivative of something let me write it over here, like uh, we have x to the n, then the antiderivative of x to the n would be something like uh, what? Well, I'm going to increase the power of x, right? Just like I did over here on this example. I want to increase the value of x, so I get x to the n plus 1 power. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by the new power, which is n plus 1. So if you want to call this the reverse power rule or something, that would be appropriate. Uh, but if you're trying to take an antiderivative of x to a power, then raise the power by 1 and divide by the new power, Okay, which in this case is this n plus 1. Okay, so uh, that's an antiderivative for x to the fifth and an antiderivative, in fact, for x to the n. What if we had something like g of x is equal to sine of x? Then what would be an antiderivative, capital G of x, for this guy? Well, now we have to be a little bit careful because it's very tempting to just take the derivative. And that's not what we're looking for here. We're not trying to find the derivative of sine of x. We're trying to find the antiderivative of sine of x. Uh, and so we have to think about whose derivative is sine. Well, what's the derivative of cosine? The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So what if we took negative cosine of x? Whose derivative is 
if we have negative cosine of x, what's the derivative? The derivative of cosine is negative sine times a negative is sine, and that's it. So the antiderivative of sine of x, uh, an antiderivative for that would be negative cosine of x. Okay, so that's good. Uh, let's try one more just for fun. Um, what if we had um, h of x, little h of x, is equal to 1 over x? Well, uh, then we get capital H of x, and so what would be an antiderivative for 1 over x? Well, uh, the answer is, uh, what is the function whose derivative is 1 over x? And your answer might be ln of x. And that's a good answer, and it actually is even to some extent true, but we need to get a little bit more careful than that. Notice that up here in this function, uh, I never said that x was positive. But in this function, x is positive because ln only inputs positive numbers. But the way that I can deal with this is I just put an absolute value on that x, and then everything's fine. So the antiderivative of 1 over x isn't necessarily ln of x. It's ln of the absolute value of x. If x is positive, everything's fine. If x is negative, now everything's fine. So this is good. Uh, this is the antiderivative of 1 over x. Okay, uh, now let's look at some notation that we'll often use uh, when we're doing this. By the way, uh, let me erase this real quick, and let's go back to an earlier problem. My very first problem I asked you is what's an antiderivative for f of x is equal to 3x squared. And we said that the antiderivative was x cubed, which is, and that is an antiderivative. Is there another? Is there any other function whose derivative is 3x squared? Uh, and maybe you think, well, what if I just add 1? Uh, is that an antiderivative? Yeah, it is, because think about it. What's the derivative of x cubed plus 1? Well, it's 3x squared. Also, what's the derivative of x cubed plus 7? Well, it's 3x squared. What's the derivative of x cubed plus 100? It's 3x squared. So all of these guys are antiderivatives of 3x squared. So sometimes I'll want to write all of the antiderivatives of 3x squared. And because of what we called the constant difference theorem that I got in the last, uh, in my section over the mean value theorem, then we could say that maybe we call this x cubed plus c. And that c just represents all the different constants that could be tacked onto this thing and still be an antiderivative. So c could be 100, it could be 7, it could be 1, it could be pi, any constant. So uh, that c, later we're going to call that guy the constant of integration. So let me write a definition now and show you some notation that will be really common for the rest of this course and into calculus 2 and 3. Okay, so uh, a definition. So we're going to write the following. We're going to write the integral of f of x dx, uh, and that's equal to capital F of x plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. Um, and f of x is an antiderivative of um, little f. Okay. Uh, what we call this thing that I'm about to circle, what we call that guy, this is called 
the indefinite integral of little f. Okay, c is called the constant of integration. Okay, so we have this integral symbol up here, integral symbol f of x dx. So there's kind of three parts to what we call the indefinite integral. And let me um, talk about each one. So let me move on really quickly here. And um, let's talk about each piece. Let me clear this. And so let me rewrite this. This is the integral of f of x dx. And there's several things to say. So first of all, we've got the integral sign. This is uh, what we call, well, this is the function being integrated, or sometimes we call this the integrand. And then back here, uh, this is a dx, which is kind of telling us that this integral is with respect to the variable x, okay? And you need those three pieces to have what we call an indefinite integral. You need the integral sign saying, take the antiderivative of, you need the middle integrand, the function to take the antiderivative of, and you need the dx to tell us what is the variable here. and uh, when you're in calculus, it's very easy for students to forget the dx, and it's very, very bad to do so. Uh, here's something I could write. If I was just writing an algebraic equation and I wrote the following, and I just left it that way, well, how bad does that annoy you to see something like that, this 3x plus 2? Is it kind of killing you right now? Is it bothering you? Because I could leave it there for a while. And you're saying, please, Dr. Wills, please just close the parenthesis. So yeah, you close the parenthesis and life is wonderful again, right? Uh, it's the same thing as if I write something like this, integral of f of x, and I don't write that dx on the end. It's incomplete. It's kind of like I've opened a parenthesis, but I haven't closed the parenthesis. So you can kind of think of the integral sign itself as the beginning of a statement, and you also need the end of the statement. And the end of the statement is, what are you taking the integral with respect to? And the answer in our case is going to be with respect to x. Okay, so it makes sense that you need, anytime you have an integral sign, you also have a flag or a dx telling you what you're taking the integral with respect to. Okay, So we call this the indefinite integral. And all an indefinite integral really is is saying, see this function here? Find all of the antiderivatives of that function. So not just one of them, like we were doing before, but all of them. Okay, So let's look at some example homework problems now to get a better feel for how to do this.